Hi everyone, my name is Leah and I am not filming at Lighthouse because I'm actually in the UK where I'm studying at King's College London um, as a master's student in digital humanities. I've been a member at Lighthouse for about seven years now and I miss you. Preparing for this testimony has made me miss you even more because it just brought back so many memories of the ways you, my church family, have counseled, encouraged, prayed for, and, and walked with me through my educational journey. In that sense, writing this testimony was such a joy because all I had to do was recall your encouragement and example. But preparing for this testimony has also been a challenge because of how much everything, including education, has radically shifted because of the pandemic. As I've been reflecting, I've been thinking about and praying for all of you. Some of you may be homeschooling for the first time and you're trying to figure out how to educate your kids well when everything's being done through distance learning. Some of you may have worked incredibly hard to get into the university of your dreams, only to find that, like me, your classes are all online and you'll be living at home for the foreseeable future. Some of you may have had your dreams of a graduation ceremony put on hold, and right now you're just trying to figure out how to enter an economy where all the preparation you've put in may not be enough to get you the job you've been hoping for. Maybe just bringing up the topic of education brings up only more tiredness and feelings of uncertainty, especially as you look at the direction of our culture's insistence on the kinds of values they believe should be integrated into education. I really wish that I had more to offer in terms of clarity and comfort. As I share my experiences and testimony, I'm, I'm just speaking as a sister in Christ who has the same questions that you do. The other reason why this topic is tricky is because there's not really a clear way to say this is what good stewardship in education looks like. Academics is often talked about as an idol to be wary of. On the other hand, considering education as an idol to be avoided can also be used to excuse a lack of discipline or laziness. My perspective as someone who went through the public school system her whole life is also going to be very different than some of the challenges that maybe your family is going through. For others, the idea of listening to a talk on education may feel unrelated to your life. Well, first of all, thank you for listening and for the privilege of being able to share God's faithfulness and sustaining truth with you. I don't have straightforward answers or solutions, but my hope is to share with you some of the principles that God used to shape me as a follower of Christ and how that's molded my path in education. So here are four principles that have helped me think through how to honor God as a student. Number one, remember your mission. About a year ago, I had a conversation with Josh and Carrie Kira about the challenges, opportunities, and blessings of being a Christian in academia. For those who don't know him, Josh is a professor of philosophy and theology at Cedarville University. And as we talked about the shifting landscape in academia, I thought one of his answers was really insightful. He said one of the things he grieved about the direction of education was seeing the focus of education shift from building up students to be good citizens to helping students become more marketable and ready for their jobs. My gut response when he said this was, there was a time when educa education wasn't about jobs. I can't remember a time when a teacher tried to encourage us by saying, learning this will make you a better citizen rather than learning this will be great for your resume. And as I thought about it more, I asked Josh if this shift in expectations towards education was why it was so hard for women in the church to feel like pursuing education is a good form of stewardship when most of the time they will eventually put their careers on hold to better love their husbands and kids. And I think this is a sense that a lot of people feel after they graduate. What was the point of all that money, time, and work if I can't do what I've been trained to do, if I can't get a job that lets me use my gifts? In this time of COVID, maybe another question is, what's the point of being in school if I can't get the full high school experience or, or college experience? And these are valid questions. There are definitely times when thinking about what it means to be a good steward will call you away from doing anything remotely academic related. It's also good to choose an educational pathway that is most fitting for your gifts and resources and how you want to use them. 
One of the things I tell community college students is that transferring to a four-year university is not for everyone. Some of my students who pursued vocational training or business ventures are doing really well for themselves, and they would have been miserable or struggling if they had gone down the traditional educational route. My point is not to talk about what I think education should look like or what choices I think people should make, but just to recognize that like all things, the education system has values and a mission that shape what people in the system expect out of it. And most of those things are good things. It's good to want to use your gifts to get a meaningful job and do it well. But as we say at Lighthouse, even good things become dangerous when they become ultimate things. Life is about worship and education is not an exception. If getting a job is my ultimate mission out of education, and of course, I'm going to be discouraged and feel hopeless when that job market doesn't allow me to fulfill the mission. If getting ready for the next stage of life is all that education is about, then of course I'll feel anxious and overwhelmed when getting to that next stage is delayed as family responsibilities, health struggles, financial difficulties, anything interrupts that process. Or if education is all about rising in my career, then of course I'm going to struggle with comparing myself to the successes of others and justify shortcuts to get ahead. But if the mission of education is encompassed within a greater ultimate mission, then that's going to change not only how and why I pursue education, but also bring hope and purpose to the journey through it. I love how Lighthouse explains discipleship through our mission statement, that we exist to worship God through fulfilling the Great Commission in the spirit of the Great Commandment. As a Christian, my ultimate mission of loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength so that I might help others know and follow Jesus Christ is going to color everything about who I am as a student, employee, or any other title. I think one of the best places to start thinking through how our mission affects education is whether discipleship is our priority when we choose our majors or careers, or when we counsel others in their pathways. Now, I don't think this means you have to go into full-time ministry to choose a God-honoring educational path, or that you have to change your path at all. But I do wish that more students would consider their choice of major and career through the framework of discipleship. Am I choosing a major that allows me to be a light for the gospel? Am I choosing a pathway that will equip me to use my gifts in the best ways to practically serve and love my neighbors? One of the things I've learned is that while I have definitely benefited from counseling at my universities, it's often not enough because the focus is on me, how I'm wired, what my preferences are, what my personality type is, and what I want to do. While it's so helpful to know our gifts and passions so that we know how to cultivate and channel them well, the danger is that this self-tailored approach to making decisions can steer us away from our mission to live life not for ourselves, but for the glory of God and good of others. No matter how old you get, nor how far out of college you are, you will never escape the icebreaker questions. So what do you do? What did you study? Why? If our mission shapes what we do, then these questions should be ready opportunities to shine brightly for Christ. Following Jesus has made my education path one that only the gospel can make sense of. I was on independent study, basically distance learning before it was cool, through most of middle school and high school due to health difficulties. After high school, I worked full time developing tech in the clinical research industry when my family was going through different financial and health problems. I eventually started taking classes at El Camino College, hoping to eventually teach in tech when I began questioning whether my career would be the best way for me to love others and make Christ known. I knew I loved teaching, and I started getting drawn to the humanities as I saw how my English professors were able to use their platforms to engage with students, listen to their life questions, and speak into their worldviews. When I switched from computer science to being an English major, it made zero sense to my professors and peers. I am so grateful to the family at Lighthouse and to my parents who pointed me to Christ through the decision-making process, um, who supported and encouraged me by pointing out the ways that my personality and gifts would lend itself well to a humanities classroom. This was important because I needed help with discernment. 
I have friends who beautifully live out their gospel-centered hope in tech, and I needed help assessing my heart and gifting in order to make sure I wasn't just making this, deci this decision out of selfish or foolish reasons. The decision also took time because one of my biggest worries was whether or not switching career paths would make me a poor steward of all the time and effort that I had already put into my tech career. But what gave me comfort was just knowing that in choosing to pursue English, my end goal to glorify God, love my neighbor, and make Christ known was still the same as it had always been when I'd been a developer. In that, I could rest in knowing that nothing was really being taken from me. In fact, this was just God making straighter the path that I was entrusting to him. Matthew 6, 25 to 34, where Jesus talks about not being anxious, but trusting in the providence of God was a close comfort to me, especially verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Those of you who heard my testimony at Christmas know how kind God has continued to be to me since then. A few years later, I transferred to UCLA where I discovered a newer field called digital humanities, where computational technology is used for research in the humanities and humanities questions drive the teaching and development of technology. Very nerdy. The, the newness and relevance of this field though opened up opportunities to meet scholars around the US and eventually led to me being selected for a scholarship to study in the UK, where I have the chance to work with international scholars in Asia and in Europe. Best of all, the randomness of my background means that people out of curiosity will ask how I got into my field, and I just get to testify to God's sovereignty. I don't know how long I'll be doing what I do now. Who knows what life changes may happen? I also am fully aware that there will probably be a day when I'm asked not to teach or will not be able to due to my convictions. I'm also in the same boat as many of you students who may be struggling with fears over getting behind in your career path or are wondering if there will ever be a day when we can return to in-person school again. But there is hope. As we cast our anxieties on him who cares for us and say with Paul, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Number two, enjoy God and seek his kingdom. One of the things my dad would tell us when we'd complain about school growing up was to try to see the beauty in our studies that others saw. Every lesson, concept, theory, or principle that we learned in school was something that countless people had devoted their entire lives to studying because they saw something of great beauty or significance in the object of their studies. Pick a leaf from your garden, a weird sounding ingredient on the packaging for your lunch. Choose the randomest color you know and look it up. You'll find that people have written pages upon pages of data, research, thought, and analysis on the things that you and I might take for granted. And if this is the joy of non-believing scholars, how much more should Christians find joy and purpose in our studies as they point us beyond the creation to the Creator? Our world is speaking and calling us to behold our God. And what's amazing is that this points us to a God who wants to be known and makes himself known whose invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. One of the experiences I loved as an undergrad was exactly what most people hate, GEs and prerequisites. And that's because it was an excuse to take classes on all sorts of topics and fields that I would never have chosen for myself, and I got to see God at work in them. I will say though, that enjoying God through my studies is not the natural bent of my heart because I usually want to make my studies about me, what I want to do, what I believe, and how I want to use my time. Finding joy in my studies is even harder with distance learning. For example, one of the tricks I've picked up is that I can listen to my lectures at about three times the speed. I get stuff done, but I've realized that when I value efficiency or anything over knowing and enjoying God, I'm a lot more frustrated when I don't understand something or discontent when people get in the way of what I want to do, like when something isn't being taught clearly or efficiently. All of this can lead to apathy, 
or discontentment in my studies. But if worshiping God is the posture of my heart even in my studies, then that's going to loosen my grip on the wrong things and open my joy to the right things. Another way I've learned to enjoy my studies more to the glory of God is to think about how a biblical worldview informs what I'm studying. Doing so makes it easier to enter conversations with friends with greater understanding and purposefulness. For example, I am not a math person and enjoying math is not my bent, but there are a lot of people I love who do love math. And I'm finding now that all those math classes I trudged through have given me a basic vocabulary and framework to understand what my friends are talking about and to actually appreciate what they love and do. It also lets me know their world a little bit better so I can enter it. I can point them beyond equations to the creator who has structured our world in beautifully logical ways. I can affirm their attention to detail and discipline and their love for making sense of the world and making things work. I can celebrate that my friends are better than me and value how God has gifted and wired them so uniquely in his image. And if I'm really struggling through a subject, what helps is hearing the perspectives of brothers and sisters on why they got into the fields that they did and how a Christian worldview informs their work. When I'd counsel community college students, Christian and non-Christian, I noticed that there often wasn't a huge difference when I'd ask them why they chose the field they did and why they enjoy it. Most answers end up being because the person has a specific gifting, because they want to help people a certain way, because they want a particular lifestyle, or because an experience shaped them. And those are wonderful things. But I've also seen what a difference it makes when a Christian has thought carefully about how a biblical worldview informs their work. For example, I have friends in the bridge ministry who not only have a heart for kids with special needs, but they have also thought carefully and joyfully about a biblical understanding of a church, of what it means to be made in the image of God, and of the eternal hope that we look to in order to inform the work they do. I also have non-Christian friends who I admire greatly in the same field, but a major difference is that these friends don't have a deeper explanation for why they do what they do, except that they feel like they ought to. My friends in Bridge are the kinds of Christians that are prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in them and are at the ready to point people to the Lord they serve. Number three, love your neighbor. Neighbors are any person that God brings into your path. And what I love most about being a student is the freedom and opportunities I have to build relationships with my neighbors. Working full time before undergrad showed me the extra limitations to building relationships and sharing the gospel in a work environment, as well as at a stage in life when lifestyles, relationships, and perspectives are more fixed. I remember trying to share the gospel with my boss and while he admitted that he admired a lot about Jesus and the church, he was hesitant about Christianity because of the impact that becoming a Christian would have on his wife and kids. It's not to say that we should let the hard get in the way of being a Christian witness in our workplace, but I just wanna highlight the unique opportunity that students have to get to know and love others at a time when their neighbors are at a crossroads in their life decisions and beliefs. Not only are you constantly meeting people, but you're meeting people from every place and every background. Dan Lim, Euphemio, and Spectrum, our international student ministry, really shaped how I looked forward to my time as a student, as an opportunity to build friendships and advance the gospel, even to the nations. Right now, I am on the wackiest sleep schedule uh, because my classes often have to accommodate three to four time zones, but it's also so exciting to look at the faces of my classmates and think, that person could be my brother or sister in Christ in China, in Italy, in Canada. Now, when COVID started, I wondered what loving my neighbors in, uh, would look like on Zoom. Still, God has shown me how much I make excuses to move away from people by, by using distance learning as an excuse when I should be moving toward people. When I'm in student mode, it is easy to be multitasking or not listening at all when other people are talking because no one can see me or what I'm doing. Distance learning also makes it so easy to make classroom engagement, conversations with classmates, and relationships with teachers something that is entirely done on my terms. That in turn 
makes it so easy to opt out when the topic of conversation gets hard or uncomfortable. And that's a habit I really don't want to develop. In school, there will be hard conversations. Conversations where, where simply stating that you're a Christian will turn everyone against you. And the easy thing will be to turn away from those conversations. I did. When I became a Christian and my very identity put me in tension with other people, the easy thing was to surround myself with other Christians who thought like me, acted like me, and who understood me. And in doing so, not only did I cut myself off from so many people who need Christ as much as I do, but I also missed out on opportunities to listen, learn from, and love others who are not like me. In college, I was nervous about requirements to take classes on subjects that were opposed to a Christian worldview. Everything from classes on gender and sexuality to critical race theory. But God really used those classes to deepen my love for my neighbors. While my convictions remain the same, listening to the experiences and perspectives of my classmates made me realize two things. One, that they were a lot like me. Sinners and sufferers made in the image of God. By cutting myself off from really building relationships with my neighbors, I let my only understanding of their experiences come from the things I had read or heard, which largely turned them into caricatures. Learning more about history, politics, culture, and theory helped me better understand the voices that were speaking into their worldviews, as well as the experiences that had shaped them. Even though I didn't agree with my classmates, I could understand where they were coming from and have compassion for them because the only real difference between me and them was not that I was more moral or wise, but because God in his electing, saving grace had for some reason saved me and given me a new heart. I could very well have been my friends and believe the same things that they, they did had God not rescued me. The second thing I learned is that because I love comfort and the easy thing is for me to turn away from people who are different. I am often my own biggest barrier to gospel ministry. There were only two times in undergrad when, to my knowledge, there was another believer in my class. And at first, that was terrifying and uncomfortable. But as time went on, I realized that in these classes were the very people who would normally close themselves off from Christians. I also realized that much like I had made caricatures of specific communities, they believed that all Christians were like those in the media. And as a result, the Jesus they were rejecting was largely a caricature and not the Jesus of scripture. There was one time when I very clumsily shared the gospel with a friend who was a huge advocate in the LGBTQ community. Although my presentation was messy and simple, I was surprised to find my friend crying. He told me that he had been condemned by Christians his whole life, but this was the first time someone had taken the time to explain who Jesus was to him, and Jesus was beautiful. In tears, this friend asked me, why didn't someone share this gospel with me sooner? Now, I'm not promoting that Christian students sign up for the kinds of classes that I took. They aren't for everyone, and for some, the, the wise thing would be to put some distance between teaching that may be unhelpful or unprofitable. But these classes showed me that I shouldn't distance myself from people. I want to be more like my savior, who moved towards the most unlikely people, even those whose values, worldview, or lifestyle radically differed from his own, and loved them. Because that's what Christ did for me while I was still helpless, running headlong towards sin and hating the things of God. Number four, rehearse your identity. Education is one of the clearest places where you can just see the endlessness of striving. I've gone through four rounds of school applications since graduating high school and even more rounds of job applications. Being a student has easily trapped me into thinking if I just study one more hour or skip this one devotional time, I will be able to be a better student, a better steward of my education. And those are the times when I need even more time in prayer and in the word. Besides the expectations that you face as a student, you're also inundated with the world's teachings. As Lighthouse says in counseling, just do the math. If I'm spending more time dwelling on the teachings of the world than grounding them in the word, then of course my heart will start to drift. So if you're a student, please don't underestimate your sin and the allure of the world. 
In many ways, Zoom everything makes it even easier to hide sin and grow complacent in the pursuit of godliness. The most important piece of advice that I have for students is to be involved in the life of a healthy local church. I chose UCLA over other schools that would have taken me farther away because I knew that as a transfer student, I'd be entering my final years in college with lots of things competing for my attention and affections. I wanted to remain a part of a local church family that knew me well enough to call me out when they saw my heart wandering and point me back to Christ. What makes all the difference in life is being surrounded by reminders that Jesus is not only right and true, but better. And Lighthouse, you do this so well. During my senior year at UCLA, when I was being bombarded with counseling, advising, and alumni success stories, the thing that brought my wandering heart back to Christ over and over was seeing you beautifully adorn the doctrine of Christ our Savior. The way you moms die to self day after day to love your kids. The way you aunties memorize and meditate on scripture. The way you single ladies live in such a way that points to the sufficiency of Christ and fullness of joy in him. I love seeing who joins Lighthouse's counseling class because there's almost always grandparents in the course. Grandparents that are putting themselves in the way of truth, training themselves in godliness out of a fierce love for their church families, just demonstrating that there is no retirement from the kingdom. I look at so many of you ladies and think this is who I want to be like. The models of success that education places before us are not bad in and of themselves, but if they're the only models of success that you have as a reference point, then they'll be even more attractive. We students need mentors who will not only ask us when we wander, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul, but also those who will point us to the one infinite glorious treasure worth giving all that we have for, reminding us that there is no greater calling than being a child of God. Lighthouse, you help me look forward to the day when my education really won't matter. My academic goals and interests are small attempts to do good in a world that is sickened by sin. Someday that work will be over because sin will be no more, and every earthly crown, recognition, or reward will be quickly cast down as we behold and worship our King. To end with one of my favorite quotes by John Newton, when we get safe home, we shall not complain that we suffer too much by the way. No, when we awake in that glorious world, we shall in an instant be satisfied with his likeness. One sight of Jesus as he is will fill our hearts and dry up all our tears. Let us then resign ourselves to his hands. Let us gird up the loins of our minds and be sober and hope to the end. Let us, like faithful servants, watch for our Lord's appearance and pray earnestly that we may be found ready at his coming.